Welcome back fellow armchair generals, this is Gamer1745 here with my continuing playthrough of Hearts of Iron 3 with Black Ice 8 and Third Reich, Invent Third Reich Events installed along with German graphical augmentations, completed a few trades, uh, and the Dworms mods and Alexi's units of the Third Reich and a couple of other minor mods of mine, Tanganyika and such. Okay, technologies. We just improved our recon unit communications. Now we're going to try to improve our recon unit coordination. Yeah, we'll sell you some supplies. Still making plenty of supplies. Right now, taking some advice from some of the uh, foreign members. Not to upgrade at this time. Eh, goes against my nature, but we'll try it here. I can see the point. I don't know, maybe sometime in mid-38. We will... Yes... Uh, no. Um, we will again start the upgrades because so I want them full. I want units fully upgraded for the um, start of the war. But since they're not doing anything now, we can concentrate that um, in building factories. Yes, all right. Albania, no. Do I know where? Well, let's see if we can. They want to buy some supplies? No. Albania, see if they want to buy some supplies. No. Soviet Union should. Let's see if we can sell them 20. And the US, let's see if we can sell them 10. Good. Okay, aircraft carrier hangars have advanced. Research into them at least has. Okay. I think we're gonna go back over to engines. Now, I know that Herman's gonna be watching this and he wants me to build a um, carrier real soon. I don't know how soon we are gonna build one, but the next version of TRE, um, we've got, I've got a contribution that will by events um, stick in a few more historical German ships like you know um, Bismarck Tirpitz and those and one of them is going to be the Graf Zeppelin so not the Graf Zeppelin Zeppelin but the Graf Zeppelin carrier of course so we will be that will be in the next version of TRE. So, and, um, well, God, I'm forgetting who's contributing that. Um, I'm going to have to look that up. And obviously, uh, even if you're watching <laughs> the, the person who's contributing, you will be um, credited, of course, in the credits. I'm just slipping my mind at the moment. They're set to be modeled um, on how they were historically, not 
um, dependent on what text you've researched. Okay, we are all the way in. So I'm going to. Change that teeny fraction. Okay, we'll sell Yugoslavia some supplies. Yeah, we'll sell Hungary some supplies. Finland, Finland. Oh, sure, 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 sure. We want to develop that relationship. Okay, a few more factories went down. Looked like there. Just making sure we're still all factories all the time. I'm just going to do this until the end of... 1937 and then I'm going to only at that point will I allow these factories to um, I am going to keep reinforcements up I don't want units to slowly fade only then am I going to start allowing other stuff into the production queue to actually being built Pilot training, now pilot training advanced. Okay, well, we'll go over to air superiority tactics. So at that time, we'll start. But obviously we will be, um, there will be stuff still in production, still trailing off in 38. ground crew training as well, so that we will move to interception tactics. As you saw from the last game, we had a bit of a deficiency, not so much against the West in battling over Germany, because I keep my airplanes over Germany, and hopefully they can overwhelm the British. But I'm just going to do a quick save here manual as well. Um, 
but in the Soviet Union and part of that is a numbers game but another part of course is the technology level of your aircraft and your um, training level. Okay, the Ninth Party Congress. Every year they had a theme. This is um, Rally of Labor. So um, I think so I was just watching. Um, uh, oh boy, um, I remember the the Nazi Plan. Um, yeah, that's the movie is called The Nazi Plan. It was made in 1945 purely of um, captured film clips. Uh, I forget the director's name who put it together. Um, mildly known director at the time. Uh, he was serving in the Navy um, during World War II. And it was for the Nuremberg trials. And it was a film evidence, if you will, of the Nazis' plan for anti-Jewish things and other other elements and they were going through that and I did see some um, historical mistakes which I thought were interesting um, early in the film they had Hitler and they and they put um, a subtitle below it of Hitler and Goering when it was Hitler and um, Otto Strasser the one that died um, or that Hitler had killed not the one that escaped to Canada, the brother Gregor, uh, had that, and they showed, quote-unquote, some early tanks um, in, like, 19, when they were supposedly, like, in 1933 or 34 or something, and it was, like, a British Mark IV and uh, Italian CV-33s. Later, by, like, the 35 footage, they were starting to show Panzer ones. Or they were showing Panzer ones in the clip, so I don't know. They, so even this, because it was put together as a um, trial evidence, they got some stuff wrong in it. I was noticing. So, but they were talking, showing some of this, and this, um, the film footage of this of the Ninth um, Party Congress, and they, it, it was a significant changeover. Most of the earlier um, footage and then you, you do see it in there too but I like Tramp of the Will um, if you're interested there's uh, a link to it on um, down below on the um, channel page uh, I think there's Triumph of the Will there maybe not but um, it's on YouTube um, they do show a little bit of the rad but they were showing that very much for the Ninth Party Congress the Rally of Labor was not and I may have done it also at another portion of the thing, but they were very much in the film was showing the rat as opposed to the essay. So that was sort of a um, an interesting um, change. And the other thing about this is it's well shown is, is I remember reading about it as I was reading um, Albert Speer's Inside the Third Reich is sort of apologia, um, which is not an apology, but it's sort of a, um, you know, why I did this kind of thing, kind of, you know, his book. Um, mostly historical, but he makes himself out better anyway. It's the Cathedral of Lights uh, that he did. It's all of these that he used. Uh, he got, he went around, or he ordered up, he didn't go around, but he ordered up a, from all over Germany, basically, all the anti-aircraft um, light, you know, anti-aircraft anti lights that they had around, and they moved them all to the um, to the, for the Nuremberg rallies at the, the big field, uh, yeah, Zeppelin field, that sort of thing, um, for the Zeppelin field all around, to create these columns, like like Roman columns of light, instead of trying to, this is somebody, Hitler or somebody, I forget, one of some bunch of huge columns or something, but he quickly figured out that it wasn't going to be easy to do, and you could do it with light at night, so they, they shifted some of the major stuff for this Ninth Party Congress from the day to the night so that you could do this columns of light so that was sort of the interesting thing and here they're also talking about um, okay so we get some industrial capacity six more uh, which is great of course a lot of other benefits including benefits relation to Japan 
so that's very good. Okay, um, the first, second, and third standarta of the SS Totenkopf Verband, uh, SS Death End Unit. Put together, this is a Black Ice event. Again, I've swapped the photos out for them because I like mine better. Sorry, whichever one of you. Good guys, do a lot of good work, but just didn't like it. Okay, um, I'm not going to try to pronounce the German here, but this is the Medical Guide for Military Exercises. This was a part medical guide, but it was also a lot of, as you can sort of see from some of the illustration, physical training um, for running, throwing grenades, and other sort of combat type exercises. Uh, manual that was out there it wasn't just like for doctors but it was you know how to do this in a healthy way kind of stuff so this because we've gone down the path with the SA a little bit of supplies for printing up the books but a little bit of combat first aid game um, the National Socialist comp spiel um, the basically National Socialist fight games I've had that um, translated as I don't know if one of you Germans want to do it differently um, so uh, this is what they were looking like they weren't going out in the field and um, boxing with each other necessarily or you know hitting each other over the head with clubs or bayonets but it's another big sports day competition this one with a poster tying it to the SA group Southwest in Stuttgart in 1937. These things were going on um, all the time. I used the historical date there. Yeah, well, probably not so much during winter or whatever, but um, this just represents training up for the military. And improvement. So that's what that's doing. Um, Deutsche Stadion. Um, the Fuhrer asked Reich architect Albert Speer to build a German stadium, um, Stadt der Reichspartag, uh, uh, for, uh, for the Nuremberg rallies. This was going to be a huge endeavor. I mean, if you look at, if you understand the scale of these, uh, there's huge amounts of either seating or standing levels in there. And they had to look at how to be able to build it, how to be able to move the people in and out efficiently. If you move a huge amount of people in there, and then they're going to have to go to the bathroom or whatever, and get in and get out and move around. So they had to work out um, structurally and how to get all these people in and out, but also how to build it. And there were and five tiers of seats. These are you know these tiers, not five high, but five you know huge things to seat over 400,000 spectators for this and it was going to cost um, a fair amount of money but Hitler when he was informed of it you know um, well, it's just going to be the cost of two Bismarcks so hey what's the problem we're going to build you know have plenty of extra money so um, and here's a picture of Speer and Hitler going up the side of the mountain you can see here um, he built, uh, because they didn't have computer modeling, obviously, then, and yes, that's a photograph of the model, what they built, but they wanted to build this thing going up the side of a mountain. This, this, this picture wasn't taken in the final location, but that would have the right angle to test to see if you're sitting up here, will you be able to see, and how well will you be able to see down here as well as, you know, at each stage, so the right angles and how far you are away and all of that, that they were putting a lot of practical thought into this. It was um, uber building of buildings in the Third Reich style of these, you know, things, the scale of the, you know, the pyramids and greater, uh, done in stone, and obviously we can do this easier today with lighter building materials, but they were looking at building it. So, we can go, we'll lose some money, Not that's not bad, popularity, we'll gain some popularity. We would like that. We'll lose some metal. We'll lose some energy. We'll lose a fair amount of supplies. 3,000 there. 3,500. And until October 37. 
27th of October. Six percent. Or we'll gain one in descent. Lose one in unity and lose three in popularity. Um, how many supplies or, or how much you'll have to figure out how much in consumer goods we'll come back down. Um, how much in consumer goods are we going to need to pay to reduce that? How many ICs there? And uh, that and the loss of national unity by one percent are we going to take? So you have a choice here. Um, basically, a part of what this is representing is, is employment. Is because this is just the starting. This is basically um, not the starting of this construction. It's the starting of this construction here. If you want to um, build this, because um, I actually had to reshape the side of the mountain. It wasn't at the right angle. I mean, there, if you look at some of the other photos of this, I, I wish I could do a slideshow and show you easily. Um, but so we can either go with this, and it was also supposedly well drummed up in the media. This was going to be happening. So for these benefits, I'm going to take the cost and gain the, the popularity as opposed to not. But this one I decided instead of force on you is, well, this is what the few order wants, so you must do it. And you got the choice. But the choice was, either choice is going to have costs. You get to pick which ones. Okay, tourism in Germany. Nice poster. Zeppelin airplane ship. Um, obviously, this is a German war, or German Nazi era poster. I think from 37, I'm not quite sure um, exact date. But it's in English because this is part of Germany's overseas campaign to get people to come to Germany. So we gain money because Germany needs foreign exchanges. Sure, there will put obviously print up some posters and get them put around and do other things to promote Germany and travel there, but the real money is made in Americans and British and those are the probably two primary English speaking peoples obviously Canadians and Australians too but percentage wise um, Canada's not that far away but Australia especially in these days was rather far away how many would be going to Germany so probably Americans and, and Germans a lot trying to improve tourism so we get a tourism bonus okay um, Air bases in northern Germany. Yes, we will go for this. Move that up. At least that's my thinking on these events. And if you guys think I've done something wrong for some reason, you know, you think it should be less of an impact, a bigger impact, um, whatever. Quite honestly, a lot of this is wild ass guesses that I've made while looking at other similar events and trying to big look at how big of the impact of this building project versus that building project versus what would it be to build a factory you know and what would it be to build a Bismarck and similar and it's just you know trying to figure it out but it's not that I the history is good shall we say the history is solid how solid is my interpretation into game mechanics? That's another question. Okay, um, NSDAP um, OA. Um, the OA uh, Ostgruppe. Um, it is the organization for um, the Ausland organization um, for Germans living abroad. And this event is a bit of a hangover from my earlier planned project that I somewhat shelved. Um, the primary thing that this group did um, was organize up Germans overseas, not German citizens over. I want to be very specific about that. German citizens overseas, or I keep using sort of the American slash British term for it, but living in foreign countries because um, one of the the head guy or um, number two or whatever was Wilhelm Gusloff, who was a Swiss German dual citizen person, um, and this group had many offices and, and 
facilities set up in Switzerland for Germans living in um, Switzerland, not the German-speaking peoples of Swiss citizenship. This, so this was not meant to be a situation where they were like trying to stir up, um, and I have some semi-made events, though I have not included them, dealing with the German-American Bund and um, some of the uh, uh, German veterans organizations in the United States at this time. And similar things that were often dealing with Germans who had become American citizens. This organization, mostly, I want to stress mostly, they, they claim to only be, but I would have to really put mostly dealing with German citizens living in foreign countries. So, um, and, is, and it sort of works to help, when I say organize them up, um, not necessarily like get them all out to party meetings or anything like that as much as what how can we help you kind of thing oh you need business contacts you need social contacts i don't you know locally you, you need to meet somebody in the local government oh, okay well who do you know who do who do these people know you know in the local british obviously it's sort of british rule calcutta at the time in this instance and i thought this is a very interesting you know 1930s document of um, letterhead for calcutta you know, but how to, you know, facilitate and promote the Germans living overseas, but it also maintained lists of addresses and names of the Germans living there. I don't think it was any sort of requirement to register, and obviously there were a lot of people who had fled Germany which didn't like the Nazis that weren't um, associating themselves with this group. But those that they were, this gives who's local, who do we know, who can we potentially used to gather information. I could be spying, but could just be trade information or whatever. So um, we have the chance here to expand um, in or not interested. We're going to do not interested in the moment. This was um, mostly for a um, interesting side project that will be resurrected at some point. Okay. Um, Forward Work Zeitung, that's basically Forward Work um, magazine. Um, as we saw in one of the earlier events, Ford had a major um, production facility in Cologne. They were a major seller of cars in Germany. I'm sure they also exported regionally. So it wasn't all just Opel and um, Mercedes. At the time, it was Ford as well. And you can look inside the magazine, so you some examples of period um, Ford cars that were made in Germany, different than the American models, I know. So I'm going to get some improvements on engines. Okay. This is one of the D-Worms events. This is the German National Prize for Arts and Scientists. This year, architect Paul Lud Ludwig um, Trust. I don't know if it's that guy, but this is definitely Reich leader um, Alfred Rosenberg. He is very high up in the um, Nazi weirdness department, I want to say. Uh, um, he, uh, we go into some of the stuff, and I may have mentioned it in some of the other episodes, but um, he is definitely one of the ideological shapers of Nazism including major influence on Hitler um, and Hitler's view of the world because Hitler um, basically never traveled um, you know born Hitler born in Austria near, near the um, German border don't remember exactly which province then Vienna fails in Vienna then in um, Munich for the start of World War One and that was it you know, yeah, he moved around um, to the Western Front uh, during World War One, but then he was back in Munich, and he, you know, I don't think until he was really starting to campaign in the post-Landsberg prison sentence did he ever, like, I think, I don't know for sure, travel even places like Berlin, 
And so Hitler had books, I'm sure movies at the time, and they talked about, he used to watch a lot of American Hollywood films, you know, seeing the world through that. But if anybody is like I have, I've lived very um, within visual sight of where they filmed the Baywatch. It don't look like it does on Baywatch. It isn't, the world isn't, that I live in isn't like Baywatch. I mean, obviously the series is, is over, but enough of you know what that is. Yeah, you know, at the right camera angle, at the right place, yes, but you turn your head, no. So, you know, it, if you're just getting America through the, 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 the TV screen or the movie screen, you're going to get a skewed vision. Well, Hitler, um, you know, one of his big trips was, hey, to Paris after we conquered it. So, and now he knew, and I've read some reports, he knew a lot about the architecture of some of the buildings that he was visiting and knew sort of what he was expected to see. But that doesn't mean he understands Paris or France or anything like that. So, but Rosenberg had traveled. He had traveled, um, I know, up to the Scandinavian countries. I have a photo of him. I think it was early 30s, a little before this, in London. Um, so Rosenberg had traveled a lot. He, he was a, a major influence on Hitler and what Hitler's view of the world. And he was um, also a very big shaper of the nuttiness of, of the Nazis as well. And these other gentlemen, I really don't know who the explorer, Wilhelm Fletcher or Surgeons Beer or Sauerbruch, these gentlemen here. Presume. So we gained a bunch in the medicine, some transportation, destro destroyer crew training, I guess that's the explorer. Maybe is that the pool, uh, Antarctica guy? Let's say here. I don't know. The Antarctic um, exploration car. No, that's, yeah, that's... No, it's I think more 37, 38, so I don't think that's happened yet. Uh, so we gain a bunch, including industry. So that's good. Okay, we've gained high popularity. That is lovely. I wish we could always maintain that or go up to very high popularity, which gives us an additional slot. So, or a oh, slot and a half. Basically, let's see how bomb loads are doing. Um, all right. Okay, let's. That. Okay, light bomber prototypes advanced. Oh, well, that's part of it because that's obviously grayed out now. So, well, that's fine. We shift that over to improving our air types. Okay, the Great Fall Maneuvers in 1937. Um, I think that's a photo from them, but I'm not sure. Um, some of the things in the photo make me think it's not. Some of the, the way it was identified and some of the stuff makes me think that it is. Um, so I'm a bit um, contradictory. And they were in 37 wearing the camouflage helmet covers. Um, I sort of looked that up to make sure, but, but this was one of the major um, uh, maneuvers, and the, um, Guderian was very much involved in it, and it was one of the larger training maneuvers using tanks to, um, as I say, 830 Panzers, according to this. Um, I forget exactly where I got that information. I didn't dream it up, that's for sure, but... Um, and it was very much training on how to do large-scale maneuvers using pan, um, pan, the new Panzers with other motorized vehicles and that. So that was a very significant training. So we'll gain a bunch of bonuses and various techs. Uh, originally, um, the idea, basic setup, contributed by George 1941. Reichwerk Hermann Goering. We talked a little bit about this before. This was, a, as they say, an industrial um, conglomeration of, of Nazi Germany. It was not owned by Goering. It was one of Goering's fiefdoms, if you will. Uh, he had overall 
command of it. Uh, I know I talked a little bit about this in the earlier series, and it's something that recently sort of struck me again. Um, it was months that the top Nazi leaders were um, imprisoned after they were captured. And according to some of the people that were, including um, his military, U.S. military appointed lawyer and a few other people, Goering had a major change during the trial. He started out um, sort of lethargic, sort of um, not very animated, not very interesting or interested in what's going on. But after a while, he became razor sharp and really sort of really smart and re really, really with it. And Dr. Johnston said, you know, nothing um, sharpens a man's mind or whatever more than an imminent hanging. But I don't really think it was that. I really think it was once he got... Um, put in prison by the U.S., because they had custody of them, uh, no more drugs. So Herman Goering, once he got off those drugs, his mind sharpened back up. And so he got wounded in the um, 1923 Beer Hall Putsch, and that's when he started his morphine addiction. And it was on again, off again at, at different level, and I think it was very much on again once Germany was losing. I mean... Goring knew about all the super weapons that they were building, but I, he also knew that they weren't going to be enough. Even if he did, wouldn't admit it to himself, I'm sure he knew that they were losing, so I'm sure he escaped more into drugs. At different, so at different times, and I don't, I have not really read a detailed biography on Goering, like I have on some of these other guys, like on Ribbentrop and um, Speer and a few others. So I don't know. At times, I think he was really, really engaged in things, and other times he was just sort of out hunting and whatever so um, it's sort of hard to judge and I really don't know I don't think he was mostly you know detailed hands-on of this organization but it was his project he wanted to see it um, succeed he you know, the whole four-year plan and this was an element of it and so he was concerned about it very much in that way and sort of the prestige and power games within the within the Third Reich, and I know I talked quite a bit about this in the previous series, but I guess we can go over it some more, and I'll probably go over it again some more. Um, that there were power plays uh, amongst the upper elites, and a lot of them, a lot of that was how close you were to Hitler, a lot of it, you know, that kind of relationship, but also it was, Hit, Hitler used sort of divide and conquer rules of governance. He had his people um, often having multiple agencies share responsibility over over similar sorts of things and see which one would win, which one would do better. And then eventually that agency would end up taking over all of the production of submarines or something. I, you know, just using that as an example. And so there was a lot of these various infighting within Nazi agencies. So Goering, if you looked at his um, portfolio, he was, you know, you know, Minister for Prussia, he was um, forestry minister, he was Reich air minister, all at this time, um, as well as being in charge of the, the Luftwaffe. So he was doing all this stuff. So he can't in any way as one person, and unless you're going to be some sort of, you know, but even he can't really be in details on everything. But he can look into the details on specific things. But I think what he was really doing was pushing forward and trying to assign people to to what was going on. I also believe he, um, for his personal projects, um, a bit more later on than now maybe, but um, was taking a rake off out of a lot of these businesses to do other personal projects that weren't necessarily personal owned, but after they captured parts of Poland, they created a huge hunting forest that Goering wanted done under the ministry, you know, forest ministry, for, forest, ministry for you know, hunting preserve, but it wasn't going to be Goering's private ownership hunting, it was sort of the Reich private, you know, for the, the Nazi leader's private huge, huge pres hunting preserve kind of thing. We can go into more of that later on, but so he was doing a lot of that. So this is all part of the stages 
because early on when um, TRE started, we removed a bunch of stuff. This is part of the elements of rebuilding it back as part of the four-year plan is what this is. And they, um, some of the stuff probably should be changed now that I'm, I'm looking at because this is the first time I played it with Black Ice 8 and see what, how much time I want to put into it. But the metal, the oil, and the energy should probably be changed to um, the new building types instead of dropping them in this way. So that would probably be good. Um, yeah. Yeah. So it's going to cost us money. Is there representing importing some technical elements, some rare materials, and then other rare materials, metal, energy supplies, manpower, a lot of manpower goes into both building these factories and expanding the mines but also in continuing to run them and it says we will no longer have a resource it's actually we get a resource not sure it's okay let's see if we can see which one there or not. I don't see anything. Forget. Maybe it'll appear for a bit. But basically does national decision available. Yes, we're gonna do on map because I think it's cheaper for us. Okay, there we're going to end the episode there. I've been talking enough, and we've gotten a little bit more played through. Um, I think probably next time we'll start up and see what that resource was. I forget right offhand, but it um, actually adds a resource. I forget which one. All right, thanks for viewing. Please remember to like the video. Please post any comments. I really appreciate your feedback. Whether it's use this map or use this map feedback or anything else. Thanks a lot. See you next time.